Good afternoon. Welcome Hello. to all of you. My name is Gayatri Ramprasad. I'm the founder and president of Asha International, a nonprofit organization dedicated to normalizing conversations about mental health and inspiring hope and healing, one story at a time. At Asha International, we believe that our stories are our superpowers. Every time we share our story, we can end the stigma surrounding mental illness and mental health, inspire hope, and provide wellness resources to help others on their own journey to well being as well. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Adam Petit, one of Asha's storytellers, and he is a doctoral student at the University of Oregon. Hi, Adam. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me today. How are you? I'm good. It's sunny. It's nice. Um, it's been a good week. It's a beautiful start to the weekend. I it is. agree. I agree. Hey, can you please share a little bit about your own mental health story and how being vulnerable has helped you heal? Yeah. Um, feel free to ask me any like questions. I don't know how deep you want me to get into it, but um. Take, take a few minutes. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So, you know, it, it's complicated because, you know, mental health isn't, um, it's not easy to really understand at one level. And so in, in some ways, mental health uh, issues started early in life, but they didn't manifest until later, right? Um, oftentimes, um, and I'm, I'm not the only one, people that are gay, because I'm gay, um, often learn to conceal themselves at an early age, yeah. right? And they learn to uh, kind of distance themselves from others in specific ways. And and the, I was no different, right? Uh, I, I learned I was gay when I was like 11 or 12. And I started to realize that uh, I was different. And so I tried to hide those things from other people. And I think that's a really big component for mental illness and mental health issues with, within specifically the LGBT community, but also at large too, that um, we learn to hide ourselves. And so um, I had different bouts of depression through, um, through high school, middle school, and even college. And it wasn't until I got to graduate school where I saw a therapist who was gay affirming, and I've been working with him for over five years now, um, where I really started to dig in and understand exactly the mechanisms that kept me getting back into depression and anxiety, um, hiding parts of myself that I didn't really like, pretending that they didn't exist, even to myself. Um, and really kind of excavating and really beginning to understand who I was as a person um, and becoming more in line with that, that's really helped me overcome and get through depression and anxiety. And that's, thank you, thank you for sharing. And Adam, that's so important, right? When we talk about mental health, oftentimes, you know, people talk about mental illness and there's so much stigma and shame and lack of mm -hmm. understanding and misperceptions and all of that. Being human is part of that journey towards mm -hmm. mental well-being, just as it is towards physical well-being and well-being in all other aspects of life. And yet, like you said, you know, when we hide away a part of who we are yes. and live a lie, there's just no way that we can be healthy. And it, it's unfortunate that mm -hmm. we have created a world and social constructs where human beings can't just be themselves and be accepted and embraced for who they are so they can all realize their fullest potential and thrive within their, you know, their own lives, their homes, and their communities. So I, I know how hard it is, and I truly, truly appreciate your courage in sharing your story and shining a light on an aspect of uh, health and humanity that is still a struggle for millions yeah. of people around the world, right here in our own country as well. Talking about which, you know, June is Pride Month. Yeah. And the Pride community, the, gay, the LGBTQ community had a big win. Do you want to talk about it and how, and your, you know, your response, your reactions to this big win? Um, so being able to, uh, I believe that you're referencing the Supreme Court case where um, we're no longer allowed to be discriminated against. In the workplace, yes. In the workplace. You know, here's the thing is that I, we, we do live in the Pacific Northwest, right? And so luckily I've never really felt the sting of being, having to um, experience uh, feeling discriminated against, uh, at least in the workplace, um, by that. However, 
I am a part of a couple of Facebook groups and different uh, communities where I hear how this is a regular occurrence in the Midwest and the South and, and, and it even happens here in Oregon. I'm just lucky enough that I haven't had to experience that. And so I can just rejoice because it, this is another way in which people don't have to hide themselves in the workplace. And um, I still think that there's a long way to go because I do know that people still will because just because the law enacts uh, an amount of safety, there's a lot of ways to circumvent that. And there's just a lot of stigma, even socially that might come along with it. And so I, I, I am so happy with the outcome of the case, but at the exact same time, I'm still holding that we have so much more to go. And so, yeah. Well, unfortunately, I know I'm glad and grateful that there are people like you that are willing yeah. to stand up and advocate and, and work tirelessly towards making this world a more inclusive place for all of us, right? So thank you for all that you do. And again, for our viewers, we welcome any questions you have for Adam or for myself. Please um, post your comments and your questions, and we'll be very, very happy to answer them. Um, so, Nasreen Khan said she loves you, Adam. Love you too. Thank you for all the love. <laughs> Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Thank you. Adam, for example, as compared to people that identify as straight, LGBTQ individuals are three times more likely to experience a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. and, four, and the LGBTQ youth specifically are four times more likely to attempt suicide, experience yeah. suicidal thoughts, and engage in self-harm as compared to youth that are straight. Mm -hmm. What do you think we can do to address these incredible inequities in health yeah. and healing. Yeah, and I think something that's really important in the conversation when we talk about mental health with and the LGBTQ community is um, recognizing that it's not something inherent about being gay, right? That it, like a lot of people will hear that stigma and go, oh, well, gay people are broken, right? And even if that's not something that they explicitly think, right, um, that people in this community are broken, that there's something wrong with them. And in fact, that's not the case. What we actually see is that there are a lot of different levels that of discrimination and hardships that um, people in the community have to experience that straight people particularly don't, right? Uh, so on one level, there's been research that has shown that uh, when a state enacts certain um, policies that allow uh, LGBT people to get married, right? Um, suicide rates in adolescence go down for LGBT people, right? And so this is all indicating that it, adolescents are smarter than we give them credit for. They know what they're accepted. And so I remember for me as a, as a kid thinking, oh, I would never be accepted. I'll never be able to find love. I'll never be able to be open. And that was just a hopeless place to be, right? And so on, on one level, the laws that we enact uh, need to be equitable for everybody because that tells people that they're accepted or not. On the next, you know, there's this interpersonal level, right, that um, I'm glad that you brought up like suicide rates because there's this um, one program called the Family Acceptance Program. Um, and they did, they've done a lot of research on this and they've shown that uh, LGBT individuals that are uh, that experienced a high amount of rejection from their family are eight times more likely to attempt suicide in their life than those that aren't. And I think that when we hear the word um, rejection, we think people saying things like, oh, there's, uh, you know, that's not allowed. You're not like, it's bad to be gay, but it's actually even sometimes more subtle than that. Sometimes it's, you're not allowed to use the pronouns that you want with your family. Sometimes your family members will say, well, can you hide that part of yourself when we go to this family? Because, you know, we just don't want to make waves. We don't want to make it more complicated for you or um, trying to make their boys or girls more feminine or masculine to fit gender rules. Um, and even these small things lead to really big increases in uh, mental health stress down the line. And so, um, and on top of that, there's just the interpersonal stuff that goes on too, um, that it's, it's much more difficult to have uh, open friendships and vulnerable friendships if you feel like being vulnerable is going to cost you something, especially if that can be your safety and health. Absolutely. So talking about vulnerability, 
I know yeah. it's been a journey for you. So yeah. tell us a little bit more about that journey, you know, the fear of being accepted within your own family, your community, um, to the point of where, you know, you are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredible, resilient young person that you are. And vulnerability has been key to that. Right? Yeah. Tell us a little um, bit about that journey. And, and I just want to point out that, like, it, even one of the things is that even in the, if your family isn't explicitly um, uh, rejecting, even in the absence of positive words of saying, no, this is okay, right? Um, culture can come in and, and fill that gap and, and really send a message that this isn't okay. Um, boy, vulnerability, that has been a journey. Um, I think for me, it's one thing to know that I need to be vulnerable about the things that I like about myself or even being gay, right? But but there are things that I wanted to hide from people that are really common for LGBT folk to um, experience. So oftentimes people will feel as though they're needy, people will feel as though, um, or sometimes the flip side, like I'm, I'm too independent and I won't be able to make these connections or, um, and so it's these, almost these personality traits that we ascribe as something wrong with us that are actually kind of an artifact of um, of some of the systemic things that happen. Uh, for instance, um, there was some research that was done that found that LGBT folk, especially gay men, are much more likely to invest in uh, certain domains for their self um, for the self-confidence, like academics, um, exercising, uh, work performance. And this is because some of these other things that they have less control over, like relationships um, and acceptance from other people, um, these are the dials that they can turn that make it, that are almost a little more assured, right? If they you have were, control over it. Yeah. What was that? You have control over that. Exactly. And so when we look at, you know, these stereotypes about gay men that they're very interested in their own looks, right? And we, we tend to look down on them for that, but actually it's it's an outcome uh, that they've learned that I can't get acceptance elsewhere, so I have to really push into overdrives at acceptance other places, right? And so people, they're often scared that I, I can't get rejected or that I can be rejected, and so they'll isolate themselves, they'll, they'll, they'll protect themselves in ways and, and it's these outcomes that really lead us to concealing ourselves, not just because we're gay, but concealing just other parts of ourselves. Because from a very early age, gay people learn that the framework that which we approach and talk about and think about ourselves is we have to conceal and hide the parts that we don't like. And so learning to undo that has been a years long process where I have been more upfront about the things that that I don't really like about myself, but in the end go, oh, this is just an integral part of who I am. And I've really had shame about it, but it's nothing to be shameful about. And that, that word shame. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, like they say, shame kills and hope heals. And yeah. talking about that, what gave you hope? What gives you hope, Adam? I think that depends on whatever year you would ask me, right? Um, that's always shifting and changing. Um, so as an adolescent, as a young Adam, what, the young Adam that was struggling with his identity, yeah. um, you hope initially in, you know, in, in, when you were younger and now that, you know, you're at a different place in that journey, yeah. what gives you hope today? Hmm. I think that for me, when I, think back to being a young gay kid, I, I, I imagined that being able to go away and find a, a new life and found, find a new uh, world in which I didn't, because especially in the community uh, that I grew up in, like there weren't many gay people that were out. And so it felt very isolating and it felt very lonely, right? Especially in uh, in elementary school, I felt really lonely. And so I think that being able to find a community that um, was accepting and loving of me, I think, yeah. I remember watching the movie Hercules, I don't know, 
and if you the the animated version and uh, there there's a song in there that where it just talks about like i can imagine like a place where i can finally feel accepted and i, I remember really that resonating with me that i just never felt like i could be myself and i actually felt like there was a lot of things that was wrong with me until i got out of high school and i went to college and i found people that just I didn't have to change to be somebody that was accepted or loved. I, I was just somebody that was accepted and loved for who I was. And that was really healing and rewarding. And it helped me to be more vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and now that I think about it, I don't think my answer changes, right? I think that that's the thing that gives me hope. But I'm in a different place now where I actually have that community that accepts and loves me. And so it doesn't have to necessarily be hope for the future. It can be enjoyment of the life that I'm living right now. At the present, yes, absolutely. So what is what words of advice do you have for young people, young, you know, yeah, young people in the LGBTQ community that are, you know, perhaps struggling, perhaps questioning, perhaps trying to find that acceptance and the love of a community? What words of advice do you have? Or what words of hope do you have for them? <sighs> That a lot of uh, a lot of things. Um, however, I think one of the things that I really would just want to say is you don't need to beat yourself up so much, right? That I think pe people, especially in the LGBTQ community, feel like they have to take on this responsibility, like they have to be perfect, oftentimes to compensate for what they think of as like flaws within themselves or to make themselves feel safe. Right. If I if I'm perfect in everywhere else, then I can keep myself safe, and yeah. Um, yeah. I can understand that coping mechanism, and I can understand needing that. But also at the same time, it's okay for you to mess up. It's okay for you to you don't have to beat yourself up. That being said, I think something that gets really lost in some conversations when we talk about talking to LGBT youth is we have this idealistic expectation that they should be out that they should be proud and they should but that's not always the case and and and, and so for those people i would say do what you need to in order to feel safe right if you don't, if you don't feel like it's safe for you to come out you do not need to feel as though you need to have pressure to come out you need to figure yourself out and what that looks like for you on your own time there's no prescribed way for this to happen, right? Um, well, but thank you so much for saying that because safety is of utmost importance. Yes, you know, especially, when, in the, especially in these times when we're in the pandemic, right? Like I've I've sp I've thought so much about you know LGBTQ uh, adolescents and uh, young adults that are with their family who doesn't who don't know that they're out, right? Or it might not be a safe environment. And telling them to come out or just to accept who they are and be proud, that's not necessarily like that's not necessarily going to be the most helpful for them in that specific context. I think in a larger context it might be, but you know we need to be careful about just trying to tell people that they need to do one particular thing when we can trust that maybe they know what's best for them or at least that they can navigate it in a way that will and trust that they'll come out on the other end okay always always it's so important now to, for families i know that families struggle you know yeah. sometimes um family members don't quite understand or want to accept yeah. you know their child um, is gay but there is this underlying love, I want to assume, <laughs> okay? Yeah, I want to assume that too. All of us, and I want to assume that, yes, we love our children, but we are human. And because of the, uh, you know, the, the society that we live in and the way we are brainwashed, you know, with the stigmas and the shame that surrounds all these identity mm -hmm. issues, that we are unable to love our child and meet them and accept them for just the way they are, who they are and support them in their own journey to, you know, being whole, being well, right? So yeah. I, I know many families struggle with that, whether the issue is, you know, uh, mental illness or, you know, gen identity issues or whatever it is. Um, but specifically, when it comes to identity issues, you know, what advice do you have for parents in how they can be a place of love and acceptance for their children? And I think that's actually where it starts, right? Because again, coming back to the family and acceptance project that uh, I kind of referenced earlier, I really appreciate the model because they work a lot with doing therapy in groups for families of um, people with LGBT within the LGBTQ community. And 
one of the things that they do is they actually leverage the love and care that they have that the parents have because you're right it, it's often not that these parents don't care about these kids right it's in fact that they care greatly for these children and they think what they're doing is for the best right and so often parents do uh, what they think is for the best and um and so if they they look at their kid and they go i don't want them to be gay because i think that that's wrong it's a sin um they won't be accepted by their uh community right there are so many hardships that come along with it that is, that is harmful but also at the same time it's coming from a place that we can that we can work with right so instead of saying just stop that behavior and accept your kid right the other thing that we can do is we can say, you love your kid, right? And we can show them that these types of behaviors where you try to force them to not have their gender identity or try to force them to uh, fit a certain mold, right? Actually causes a lot of stress and and and, and even like death down the line uh, and a lot of other different mental illnesses and health outcomes. And so when you show them that and you say, we understand you don't have to agree or even believe that this is the right course for them, right? However, this might be the outcome if you continue the path that you're going, right? So maybe we can find other solutions for you to love and care for your child that meet in the middle and don't require you to change who they are, right? Yeah. Um, and so leveraging the love and care that all, their, all parents have for their kids, um, that, or that a lot of parents, have for their kids right it is, is a really useful thing absolutely again you know shaming parents isn't going to help you know the yeah. child it's just so, going to entrench them on the same side all right correct so i thank you you know the, yeah that's it's a yeah love love is the answer like my mother always keeps reminding me you know love is the only answer yes sometimes we don't know how to love yeah we need to learn how to channel it we need to be taught how to love and we need to be humble enough to accept that and to learn in these difficult circumstances. So thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, do, would you like to share a little bit about the research that you're working on? Uh, yeah, I've got a, a couple different things going on. Um, so some of the research that I'm doing is we're actually using um, mobile devices to detect and predict suicide risk in adolescents. Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually have different uh, sensors on the phone uh, that we can pick up and detect and we're trying to, and we ask them daily what their mood is and what their suicide rating is. And we're just trying to find ways that we can have early interventions to be able to predict and just in time reach out and say, okay, this person might need a nudge or this person might need help. Um, and so, yeah, my focus tends to be more on text base, um, but we're looking, taking a really holistic approach and trying to be able to detect and understand suicide risk in adolescents. Well, that sounds like a very timely and very needed service for all of yeah. us. And so, yeah, you know, if you could do me a favor after the broadcast to send me any and all resources that you are aware of, whether it's the family project or this particular technology, you know, we'll be happy to share it on our Facebook yeah. page um, and on our website. So, you know, it can help people, those that are in need right now. So the pandemic, the racial injustice, yeah. all of this is having such a huge impact on our mental health, on our whole well being. And so how is it impacting you? How are you coping? That's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've been doing a lot, I like, I don't know, we get, I get a lot of emails about, you know, companies that are saying in these times, specifically about racial injustice. And, and one of the things that I don't know, really makes me frustrated is that this isn't just now, right? Like you, you're just seeing it, right? right. And, and so when you say in these times, right, really you're ignoring the fact that this has been going on for years, right? Um, and I mean, decades, you know, centuries. Centuries, yeah. Right. And so this, it, it's not independent of all the other things that have been going on, right? And so I think for me that has been maybe the most frustrating part is being able, is almost 
watching people deny the existence of um, oppression in race, in, in sexuality, and all of these other things, and saying that we're, it's overblown um, just because they haven't experienced it themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but it's time, though. It's time for all of us, for you and for me and for every person that's ever been oppressed, um, yes. has been unheard or unseen to be able to stand up and share our story, share our humanity and advocate for the you know, human rights and social justice of all of us. You yes. know? Uh, when I was younger, you know, it, it was a, the depression was anger turned inward, right? Yes. Just anger towards the injustice. You know, for me, it was about gender issues, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, in addition to other traumas that I'd experienced. And, um, and, and certainly being labeled as mentally ill, it's got its own you know, the oppression that goes along with it. Um, but as I grew up, I learned that, you know, you've got to take your broken heart and create it into art, into action, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad that we're doing that as yes. a people around the world, even in these times of incredible difficulty. There are people like you that are standing up and doing their fair bit and saying, hey, you know, this is nothing new. Right. Not as old as humanity, but I'm glad they're all waking up and we are coming together and standing up in solidarity and saying injustice to one of us is injustice to all of us. Exactly. We all suffer. We right? all suffer. So it's even more important for people like you and me and for families like yours and mine and around the world to have these conversations about what inequity is all about and how it impacts us. And more importantly, how can we change Right. And for all, so where all of us and our children and their children can live in a world that will honor every single person's humanity, not only just honor, but celebrate yes. our uniqueness, our diversity, right. you know, because it's so beautiful. I can't, right. Adam, Adam is not me, but thank God for an Adam. Right. <laughs> we all have our uniqueness and it, we yeah. We do. We absolutely do. Um, in, in just in terms of uh, closing thoughts, we've got a, you know, a few minutes here. Anything that you want to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that we often think about uh, minorities and non, uh, non, uh, like in, in groups that are kind of minority, right? Um, we take a deficits model approach where we say here that like, you know, oh, people have substance use problems, right? But we never really like talk about the strengths, right? There and so I won't go into it, but like we have centered a lot of this conversation around like mental health issues that um, people face in minority groups, but also there are so many strengths that come from everything. Yeah. And so I think it's important that we also touch on that a little bit that um LGBTQ folk, because they don't have the same access to all relationships and all families, they learn to make their own family. They learn how to have their own communities, right? They learn how to connect and grow in ways that isn't typical for straight communities, right? And and that's one of the many strengths that I see that come from the LGBTQ folk. Um, they're much more compassionate, I find. Um, and so I think that being able to recognize that just because we do something different doesn't necessarily mean that it's worse, right? And taking a deficit-based model and only looking at the deficits um, can really be harmful in and of itself. And so recognizing and accepting that there is strength uh, in, these or in these individuals and in these communities is really important. I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that, Adam. Uh, because, you know, yes, uh, part of the focus, which is why, you know, the focus at ASHA International for us is to celebrate the human being, the incredible resilience within each person to overcome whatever their struggles or their traumas or their labels that society puts on them, right? Nothing can define us. Nothing can deter us from living and realizing our fullest potential. And so, yes, it is so important for all of us to, you know, not only just be mindful, but to celebrate the yeah. strength within each of us. And, and, and talking about the LGBTQ community, like the rest of humanity, or sometimes even more than the rest yeah. of humanity, their contributions to our world, whether it is in the sciences or music or art or anything, right, yeah. is, is mind boggling. Yes. 
is absolutely mind boggling. And I confess, I grew up in India where none of these issues were ever spoken about. And I, you know, my education about, um, you know, gender issues, I, I gender identity, you know, issues was in the psych ward. Right. 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 The first time that I ever came face to face, and I'm glad. I'm so glad that my heart was broken open to love and to embrace and to celebrate every person just the way they are, even more. Yeah. So I thank you for being with us today, Adam, and thank you for sharing your story, your insight, your love, and your hope with us. And I just want to celebrate you. Thank you so time. much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. This has been wonderful. Absolutely. And to all of our viewers, again, continue to post any comments or questions on Facebook and YouTube. We would love to see them. And um, again, if you or your a loved one is struggling with their mental health in any way, we're here to give you hope and to offer help. Please visit our website at www.myasha.org. You can see 150 stories of hope and resilience on our website and also find lots of resources about health and wellness and support for supporting organizations. And join us again in two weeks for yet another conversation on hope and healing. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day and weekend ahead. Bye-bye.